What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Martian MMA Podcast. I am your host, The Martian, also known as John, here to talk about this week's UFC card going down this Saturday from Madison Square Garden, New York City, headlined by a heavyweight championship fight between current champion John Jones taking on former champion Stipe Miocic for the UFC heavyweight title in the main event, along with a five-round co-main event rematch between Charles Oliveira and Michael Chandler, along with 11 other fights, 13 in total going down at UFC 309, and we're going to talk about all those fights. Bets for all those fights here in just a moment, but just a quick recap of last week. I think it was a uh, pretty solid week in terms in terms of predictions, didn't give out a whole lot of bets, but did give out some good plus money winners, especially in the, the first half of the card, you know, started things off with a plus 275 winner on uh, Mullins ITD there, uh, missed on the sub line at plus 1000 on that same fight, also hit Blackshear sub at pl- plus 500, uh, missed on Radke sub and uh, missed on Malik to win by KO in the second or third, missed on Robertson 2-3, did hit the over one and a half in the Romeus fight, and then last but not least, missed on Gerald Mearsharp money line, which uh, I was happy with as a bet, you know, plus 260. It was 1-1 heading into the third round. Um, GM3 was favored going into the third round. You know, I think he did pretty well, all things considered, and, and definitely outperformed his price tag. Um, so just came up short with the underdog play on that one. And, uh, you know, fun to see Protez continue to shine four knockouts in the, the year of 2024. So it's fun to see him getting pushed and, uh, see him having success. And it was a pretty good card, man. A lot of, a lot of finishes on this card, a very violent, um, card you know i believe there were uh, eight out of 11 finishes so that's always fun to see and uh, that's enough about last week because we got 13 fights to get into this this week a five fight pay-per-view main card but we're starting things from the bottom and we're going to talk about bets and betting angles for all 13 fights here starting things off flyweight division women's division veronica hardy taking on eduarda mora with hardy being the favorite at minus 140 mora plus 120 I think Hardy should be fine here, man. Um, you know, she's a little small for the division, but honestly, I think she's a pretty skilled fighter and has definitely been improving over the past few years. And it's been pretty evident by her racking up wins against better and better competition as well. You know, her last opponent, JJ Aldrich, was, I think, you know, her, her best win. And I thought she won that fight pretty handily. And I just don't see why Veronica should have much trouble here, man. I just think Mora is kind of, uh, you know, a uh, one-dimensional grappler who really can't sustain that grappling for more than a round. I don't think her takedowns are very good. Her top game is certainly not very good. She lost position a ton of times on Denise Gomes. And when she loses position, she just tends to slow down. And in that second and third round, we saw that uh, she was just really tired in that fight. She struggled getting takedowns. She really has no meaningful offense. And I think Hardy's, you know, her, her footwork and her striking ability should be able to punish Mora on the entries here. Sure, Hardy is probably going to get taken down here, but I don't know, man. I just didn't see anything threatening from Mora's top game in that Gomes fight. Gomes escaped and reversed her so many times that I think that even if Mora gets on top here, it's really not the end of the world for Hardy, and it shouldn't be too long before Hardy either you know, reverses or, or escapes back up to the feet, and uh, she has a big cardio and striking advantage here and should want, run away with it in the second or third round. So I think Hardy before the fight is, is a solid play. I would also be looking to add in the live lines after the first round, uh, you know, depending on how it's looking. If Moore is having success and she's landing takedown, she's working hard, I would certainly be interested on adding on Hardy, even if she's losing. And uh, a little little fun money wager I'll, I'll endorse as well is Hardy to win by KO in the second or third at 17 to 1. I just think when Moore is slowing in the second or third, she's probably going to be getting hit with some hard shots from Hardy. And uh, Hardy's got a little bit of pop behind her strikes for a little girl like herself. So um, that'll do it for that one. Moving on to the Walter Ray division, Oban Elliott taking on Basil Hafez. Odds for this one have Elliott as the favorite, minus 280. Hafez plus 240 on the comeback. Uh, I think this is likely a little bit wide. You know, it's kind of a pretty similar matchup to Oban Elliott's last fight where, you know, a uh, high intensity pressure striker grappler as well like uh well, that's kind of not an accurate description of of, of nor Hafez or preston parsons but you know a guy who's tr- you know coming out aggressive and looking to hit a lot of takedowns that should be the plan here for Hafez. Hafez does like the wing big strikes but you know i don't think there's a whole lot of technique behind them and uh 
you know, it should be a fight with just a lot of grappling and Oban Elliott's defensive wrestling and his takedown defense and everything looked really, really good versus Preston Parsons. You could tell that the guy spends a lot of time defending takedowns against the cage and uh, he's just steadily improving his defensive grappling. And it should be good enough to stuff the takedowns of Hafez. And I don't think Hafez, uh, his cardio is too good as well. He definitely slows down as the fight goes on. And I just could imagine Oban being kind of like, you know, a, a tough brick wall to, to get through that that cardio uh, troubles for Hafez here. So uh, 240 does seem a bit wide for Hafez, but inevitably I do expect him to come up short on a decision here. And, uh, you know, even a small chance that Oban finishes in the third round. But based on the, his finishing ability looks so bad versus Val Woodburn, I really wouldn't be interested in in taking it, um, even even though it is 17-1. to uh, I think this is going to be an Oban decision which is the most likely outcome here so don't really see any wagers to to catch my eye on that one moving on to the welterweight division um Hafez's last opponent here mickey gall taking on ramis brahima uh so this one I have gall minus 143 ramis brahima plus 123 so a low level fight here but i think this is a uh, gall's fight and i did uh bet on mickey gall at minus 122 i think and basically, Ramiz's game is to hit takedowns and to submit you really quickly. However, uh, I think that it's pretty clear that Mickey Gall is the better grappler than Ramiz Brahima. You know, I, I'm Brahima is I, I would say like a purple belt at best, and you know, I don't know if Gall's got his black belt by now, but he was a brown belt. You know seven or eight years ago so i imagine he has and i just don't see where mickey's going to be in a whole lot of trouble you know let's say ramiz comes out and he gets that early takedown i just don't see gall being you know in imminent danger on bottom and ramiz his his takedowns suck his cardio sucks this guy is just an absolutely dog shit fighter and mickey gall is not great himself either but i think he tries a lot harder and i think he's honestly a more well-rounded fighter and i just think that Mickey Gall's defensive grappling should be good enough to, uh, you know, void off any any submission or takedown attempts here from from Ramiz, and it's just a matter of time before Ramiz starts to slow down and uh, runs out of options. And I think Mickey should, uh, you know, take over in the second and third. And uh, yeah, I wouldn't even I wouldn't rule out a Mickey uh, late finish here in the second or third. Let's see what that, those odds are. Um, nine to one, twelve to one, not that great. I would just stick with Mickey, Mickey money line. And if Ramiz hits that takedown, and he's not submitting Gall, and Gall is you know defending well, he's working his way up. I would smash Mickey Gall's live line because Ramiz just can't fight past a round. I'm pretty sure he still doesn't have a win past a round in his single in his whole career. Yeah, he doesn't. He's a bum. Uh, certified force MMA bum Ramiz Brahima and let me tell you something the New Jersey New uh, New York crowd absolutely pops for Mickey Gall I was at his fight you know five or so years ago he fought like Salim Tuhari and I couldn't believe how <laughs> much love the crowd was giving Mickey Gall and it was on the prelims it was just a random fight but they pop for Mickey Gall so when the Hey Mickey You So Fine song comes on you know Madison Square Garden is going to be jumping in that motherfucker so moving on to the heavyweight division March into Burra Jonathan Denise odds for this one have Tabura as the favorite minus 146 Denise plus 126 I do think that Tabura is going to win this fight here and I think he's certainly the rightful favorite because uh the more time more often than not i believe he wins this fight um and i think he has the much more replicable way of winning with his grappling however i missed plus money on tabura so I, i'm i was a little salty and i decided not to just jump in on tabura because we all know tabura kind of starts a little slow he's a little you know herky-jerky when the fights first starts and i think he's probably going to have a you know a bad minute or two probably get hit with some strikes and then i think he'll probably flip back to the dog in the live line and then the second you know tabura looks to clinch up or looks to hit a takedown um that's when the fight is going to swing massively in his favor. So I'm going to wait, uh, take Tabura in the live line. I mean, after, you know, a few minutes, Denise is not a hard hitter, man. He really isn't. Um, and even though Tabura kind of quit in pathetic fashion in his last fight, uh, versus Spivak, that wasn't a good sign. Um, I think he, he should be fine here. And Denise, is, his bottom game is terrible. We saw him versus Williams in the third round. We saw him in uh, the first round versus Austin Lane. Once this guy gets taken down, he does not get up. So uh, I really could just take one takedown from Marchin Tabura. But I also saw this fight starting round two as minus 190, just slightly over 65%. Um, I think that is value and worth the bet here as well. Uh, 
because I just think that that's a little too low for this. I think it probably starts the second round maybe 75 to 80 percent of the time and uh you know some books even have it that some books have it 250 and it's 190 on FanDuel. so i took some of that uh the starts round two and looking to jump in on uh tabura live tabura's finishing props though here kind of suck i mean i know that i said that he can get on top and just convert to finish but the props for him to finish are pretty shit so um Next fight, featherweight division, Roberto Romero taking on David Onama. Odds for this one have uh, Onama minus 900, Roberto plus 600. Last week, same situation. Uh, an established UFC fighter, Zaleski Dos Santos, had a late replacement. I didn't even watch that guy's Scroggins fights. I just took a glance at his record, and I said there's no fucking way that he's beaten Zaleski Dos Santos. And that's exactly what happened. Zaleski dusted him inside of a minute. The guy did not deserve to be in the cage with him, and that's what's going to happen here. Onama physical specimen this guy is a hell of an athlete and he's probably going to put this kid in a fucking body bag and this is some criminal matchmaking honestly i really have no idea what quality of fighter this guy is romero but i just highly highly doubt he's anywhere near onama's level and this kid is probably going to get hurt really badly so onama probably uh pushes his shit in for a first round ko in a pointless fight Next fight, lightweight division, Jim Miller, Damon Jackson. Odds to this one have Jackson as the favorite. Minus 176, Jim Miller coming back, plus 151. So uh, it would be cool to see Jim Miller win this one, just like it would always be. But, you know, I, I, I don't think he had. I think the odds are probably fine here, honestly. I think the longer this fight goes, the more favors Damon Jackson. Jim Miller has not won a decision since the last time he fought in Madison Square Garden, November 5th, 2016. It's been eight years. It's been something like 15 fights or something like that since Jim Miller won a decision. And that's usually because his cardio just kind of fails him. And we've seen several guys at lightweight who are grappler heavy fighters who were able to just take over the fight and to kind of lay on Jim in the second and third rounds for a decision. Scott Holtzman, Vince Pichel, Joe Selecki, all three kind of the same thing happened where Jim fought okay in the first round, gave him a tough fight. The second and third round, he runs out of steam. He gets taken down. He just doesn't have the gas to to you know come back and win i know he does have some second and third round finishes lately but those again are against bum strikers gonzalez moda cerrone benitez those guys aren't grapplers they don't push a pace and that's why jim was able to beat those guys in the later rounds damon jackson um he does push a pace he's moving up to 155 here i think that's a pretty good move for the guy he is late into his career now at 36, and I just think that weight cut at 45 was taking a lot out of him, and uh, his cardio was becoming inconsistent down there as well. And I think that this, you know, move up to 55 is likely coming at a good time. Uh, Jim has potential to hurt him and finish him in the first round, but I really think that if Damon can survive the first, he's going to probably put some patient pressure on him for a, uh, a grapple-heavy decision. I don't think Damon is going to finish Jim, but I, I do... I could envision it being lopsided for Damon in the in the second and third. So unfortunately, can't get behind uh, Jim money line here. Uh, Jim round one, it's it's only six to one, man. They're they're very wise to that being his his win condition here, and uh, yeah, man, I think it's going to be a, a Damon decision, which is the most likely outcome according to the odds. Not really spitting anything new here, and uh, yeah, that that'll do it. I mean, I think that that is a pretty obvious outcome here damon by decision um but i would i would be happy to be proven wrong and i won't officially endorse anything here premier division one of two premier division fights card on the card next had a bit of a stroke there my fault uh chris weidman taking on eric anders odds for this one have anders has the favorite minus 115 weidman coming back minus 105 so i think this fight should have been on the pay-per-view the fact that karine silva and Viviana Araujo is on the pay-per-view leading into a Bo Nickel fight. And this fight's on the prelims. I don't understand. Maybe they're they're trying to put a uh, a very worthy fight on the prelims to make sure the crowd is in the arena by 9 p.m. That's possible. But still, man, Chris Weidman gets the New York crowd jumping. And I, I was thinking about it earlier. I, I, I made a tweet saying that he's the most beloved fighter in, in New York history. And I think that's the case. Even though John Jones is from New York, um, he hasn't fought in New York much. I think this is his first time, if I'm 
correct. Um, and you know, the guy is just such a, an asshole and you know, nobody likes John Jones. So, so, uh, Chris Weidman, on the other hand, you know, he's the all American boy. That's, that's still my boy, former champion. He rep New York. He's fought in Madison square garden a lot. I'm pretty sure he might be winless at Madison square garden. He's gotten, he's gotten absolutely butchered at Madison square garden a few times. Yo Romero put him in a body bag. So did uh, Jacare Souza. So he he needs a Madison Square Garden win here. Uh, I don't think he's getting it though. Honestly, the more I think about this, I'm gonna I'm gonna bet Eric Anders here. Uh, you know I I bet Anders in his last fight, and he did get kind of hurt and dropped by Pickett in the first round, and and kind of needed his takedowns to win the second and third rounds there, which I thought was pretty concerning. However. Outside of that, man, I think Eric should should be should be fine. Um, you know, he he's a southpaw. He's a he's he doesn't hit necessarily hard, but I I do think the guy knows how to box, and he's probably going to to make Chris uncomfortable. And Eric is actually a pretty decent defensive wrestler. Um, and he's not easy to take down, and I think without that safety net of having uh you know, takedowns here. I'm not trusting Chris Weidman at 40 years old to win a striking fight against, you know, a, a warm body here in Eric Anders. So I'm going Anders slight pick him, dude. Fuck it. I'm sending it. Uh, I'll probably be on him for, you know, a little over a unit, maybe to win a unit or a one and a half units risked. I'm um, just waiting to see where the line goes. Uh, it's possible that Weidman action can, continues to pour in, but um, I'm going to take Eric Anders here, and I think he's going to win the fight by decision. And um, hopefully we can keep the trend going of Weidman getting put in a body bag in uh, Madison Square Garden. Even though I was talking about how he should have been on the pay-per-view, if you guys listen to the podcast, you know I'm a big fan of the hometown fighters losing. I, I love when the crowd gets quiet and they boo and the winning fighter does their interview and they get booed. That's great. I love that shit. And um, like when the the World Series, I think, no, I think they won it at home, right? No, no, no. They won it in New York, right? I love that. Like the whole, oh, that was even better because the Yankees went up 5 nothing in that game. The crowd was probably buzzing. They're probably thinking we're going back to LA where we, you know, the series is 3-2. We have a chance killed all that momentum and then the home crowd had to watch their team lose and watch the winning team celebrate i love that shit i live for it so hopefully weidman gets viciously knocked out here and uh speaking of that as well just on a quick quick mention um tomorrow night is jake paul versus uh mike tyson same thing i hope mike tyson gets laid the fuck out in that fight and like he's like seizing on on the on the ground and they have to you know get like a neck brace and a stretcher that would be the absolute optimal scenario for that one so hopefully jake paul can do it i mean jake paul's gonna win it's just a matter of how badly does he hurt mike tyson and i hope he he severely injures him uh <laughs> moving on <laughs> uh really fun fight in the bantamweight division for the last fight in the prelims here jonathan martinez marcus mcgee odds for this one have mcgee as the minus 137 favorite martinez coming back plus 117 so I like both these guys. I've been a big fan of Marcus McGee in his run so far. The guy has been, you know, a money train uh, in his first three fights. However, man, I think this is a gigantic step up in competition. I mean, Journey Newson, a bum. JP buys a bum. Bolaños, not a good fighter at all. And now he's fighting Jonathan Martinez, who is, I believe, far and away the best fighter he's ever fought. And it's also the biggest stage he's ever fought in. You know, fighting in front of a, a crowd for the first time, I believe, in the UFC. Um, I believe that's right. Don't don't really know though. Sounds right. <laughs> um, so Martinez, I believe he's fought a much better competition. He has more than double the experience. He fought in a big stage last time. Went down to Brazil, fought Jose Aldo. You know, got schooled in that fight, but valuable learning lesson. And even before that, he was on a seven fight win streak. He had a uh, or six fight and. Uh, you know, wins over good competition as well. And I think the guy has been steadily improving. And he's just a really, really solid striker. His leg kicks are nasty. His body kicks, head kicks, all of it is nasty. He doesn't really throw a whole lot of hands. But the guy is a very cerebral striker. And he's, he's a very kick first fighter, which I always like to see. And he's a pretty solid defensive wrestler as well. So 
I don't know. I just I think I'm leaning with Jonathan Martinez here at plus money based on the strength of schedule difference. Marcus McGee, a good well-rounded fighter, a heavy-handed boxer with really good bo- boxing fundamentals. He can also wrestle and grapple pretty well. But Jonathan Martinez, I just think, is a significantly better fighter. And we've seen Marcus style on a few guys lately, and I think that is leading to him being wrongly favored here against a a huge step up in competition and I just don't know how Marcus is going to look once he's faced with adversity which I believe he is going to face here and I think you know Martinez is uh, controlling of of the range and the kicking game are going to give Marcus some troubles and I think inevitably or eventually excuse me I should say um, Martinez pulls away with the decision here so I think this line I would flip it Martinez slight favorite and um, I could be wrong and Marcus could you know just keep steamrolling his way to the top and you know just he could take this step up in competition and stride and make it easy but you know um, not that this means a whole lot tapology Martinez has 13th ranked Bantamweight Mar- McGee is the 41st yet the 41st ranked is uh, is favored with uh you know less than half the experience hasn't really fought anybody close to a top you know, 40 bantamweight, honestly. Like Gaston Bolaños is the best fighter he's ever fought. And I wouldn't put that guy in the top 50 of of bantamweight, you know? So I got Jay Mart there at plus money. Moving on to the main card here. First fight in a catchweight fight, which was recently moved today. Uh, Marcio Rufi taking on James Lontop. Odds for this one have Rufi minus 800, Lontop plus 550. Not too much to add here. Rufi should outstrike him, should probably find the knockout, and that's really all I have to say. You know, um, Rufi is a, a young, promising, long, big fighter at 155 who's got you know solid striking all around, and um, you know he showed solid takedown defense in the uh, Maga Maliad fight on the Contender series. Uh, and I just think Lontop is no good, man. Um, this guy was pretty lucky to get into the contender series fighting a gasser and i just don't think he probably belongs at this level and uh he's going to get outstruck here and it's just a matter of is he going to make it to a decision using some of that peruvian toughness or is he going to get knocked out i would lean with knockout and the odds agree because they have rufi ko at minus 140 honestly it's uh, that's probably fine Uh, i think that that's you know a a square winner as i would call it here we're going to move on to the women's fight on the main card the second of two women's fight on this entire card flyweight division karina silva viviana Araujo, brazilian women's showdown here they have silva minus 270 Araujo plus 230 man they've actually given uh vivi several of these brazilian show uh, brazilian showdown this is her fourth brazilian woman she's fighting in a row i don't know why they got to do the brazil on brazil violence like that even silva has fought uh, Brazilian women in three of her last four. So, you know, they're they're doing a little round robin here with the with the Brazilian women. I've always been a a skeptic of Karina Silva. I'm I'm still not convinced that she's any good, but you know, it's women's MMA and, and you don't have to be good to win fights. I do think this line is a, a bit wide here, you know. I just like what is any what is Karina Silva good at? Like I don't can I challenge anybody to answer that question? I don't believe that she's really good at anything. And Ara Ujo, um, you know, is a pretty reliable, you know, boxer cardio. You know, doesn't have great cardio, but I think she's going to show up to box for the full fifteen minutes, and she's not going to be completely easy to take down. And I think Ara Ujo should at least win a round here on her way to to you know, probably losing a decision. Uh, so I wouldn't invest heavily in this fight. It does seem like going, like it's probably going to be a silver decision as the odds indicate. That's the most likely outcome. I, I don't, I don't disagree with that at all. And, uh, but maybe, um, our Ujo's handicap line here at plus three and a half, all she has to do is win a round and you're getting that at minus 115. And even the GTD at, at minus 200 about, I think is likely value here. Uh, our Ujo has never been submitted, and I imagine that is the the the, the vast majority of the finish equity for Karina Silva here. She hasn't, you know, knocked anybody out uh, since the, you know, some absolute bum regional opponents. Pretty much, yeah. Karina Silva has never knocked out a, a women's fighter with a winning record 
Every single one of her knockouts is over 0 and 0, 0 and 1 fighters, a 2, 3 and 2 fighter. And then, you know, her submissions are over, you know, some pretty other similar low level competition. So I, I'm, I'm, wouldn't put a single penny on anything related to Karina Silva here, even though I am probably going to pick her to win by decision. It's just not a not a favorite I can get behind at 75%. And hopefully Viviana, uh, at the old age of you know 37, she's turning 38 next week, uh, can can pull out a competitive fight and hopefully she can cash as a dog here. But I won't be actually betting on her money line to do so. Uh, I think the handicap is the the way I would stick with playing her. We are moving on to the second of two premier division fights on this card. Bo Nickel, Paul Craig. Odds for this one have Nickel minus 1,300, Craig plus 850. Uh, man, they're really taking their time building Bo Nickel, aren't they? I mean, it's we're coming up on a year and a half of him in the UFC. Oh, no, even longer. Um, he's already made it past a year and a half in the UFC. Still yet to really be tested. So I understand he's he's... Only six and zero. He has. He's only gone out of the first round one time. Uh, but this is a very slow build. But it's not the worst build because Paul Craig. He's well known. He's you know a fan favorite. And putting Bo in a fight where I think a lot of people probably think that Craig is uh, somewhat of a danger to Bo here. I really don't subscribe to that at all. I think that that Paul Craig's grappling is an extremely minuscule threat to Bo Nickel. I mean, Bo Nickel's strength and his physicality makes it very, very difficult to envision any type of uh, submission being a problem for him. Like if Craig tries to arm bar or, uh, or triangle Bo, Bo is going to Batista bomb him through the fucking mat. Um, if you don't know who Batista is, you've got some research to do because, um, basically the the rampage jackson slam of that brazilian guy back in pride that'll happen here but honestly bo's probably just going to hit him with a punch and knock him out instantly i mean i mean paul craig is an absolute dog shit fighter uh the guy striking sucks his defense and chin are terrible his takedown defense is is terrible. He essentially is looking for a Hail Mary submission in all of his fights. And it has somehow worked for in a lot of wins because, you know, 185 and 205 are lower level divisions. But man, Paul Craig sucks. And despite him having some fun comeback wins and a jovial personality um, and the face pain and whatnot, I hope he gets hurt here. I hope Bo Nickel, uh, you know, leaves him with the toes curling. Uh, anybody who gets knocked out by Paul or by Johnny Walker deserves, you know, infinite punishment. So, uh, Bo, Bo's going to put him in a body bag. First round knockout for Bo and Bo KO at minus one thirty. I, I I can't even call that a square winner. That's a plus EV winner. They have Bo sub at plus two ten. I don't see why. I think it's because Bo has majority subs. You know, he has four subs compared to two KOs, but I just don't think he's going to tr fool around with Craig on the mat. Obviously, a, a sub could still happen because he's just going to be so positionally dominant on Craig, but I would lean with the KO, you know, much heavier than where the odds indicate. So they have KO at like 57% while they have a you know, sub at 33%. I think it's more like, you know, 65 25 or something so i think ko is worth a, a bet at minus 130 uh for not even a square winner a plus ev favorite method of victory prop which you don't see too often moving on rematch lightweight division co-main event five round fight charles Oliveira, former champion taking on michael chandler odds for this one have Oliveira as the favorite minus 255 chandler plus 215 Chandler coming off a two-year layoff. Last fight was in Madison Square Garden two years ago versus Dustin Poirier in a very, very fun fight. A fight he came up short in due to his own dumb decision-making, which has kind of cost him in the majority of his losses throughout his career. And um, considering Chandler is inactive, uh, he's 38 now, I think that Charles is just on a different level. And even though their first fight had that close moment where um, – Chandler did, you know, hurt him with a few punches. Uh, I think that that was probably like the absolute most success that, that Chandler can have. And he really needs to, to hurt and, and finish Oliveira early on here or else um, Charles 
you know, better well-rounded skill set, his better cardio is, you know, honestly, he's probably the better athlete at this point in his career. Charles uh, Chandler looked really lean and skinny in a picture I saw of him. Uh, so I think all Oliveira is going to finish and it's likely going to happen under one and a half, which, um, the odds are privy to, they have it at, uh, a near pick and price for under one and a half, but it's hard to imagine this fight being anything but chaotic. Michael Chandler really doesn't know how to fight anything except a chaotic fight. Um, you know, the, uh, <laughs> I got I caught up here. The Dustin Poirier fight was an absolute barn burner in the first round. He got dropped by Tony Ferguson in the first round. Same with Justin Gaethje. Crazy first round. Uh, you know, high intensity round one versus Charles Oliveira, where he got knocked out at the start of round two there. So, uh, you know, four out of four to five of his UFC fights have gone under one and a half. And the one that did that made it over one and a half um, was an absolutely barn burner tempo. So. I think this one does go under one and a half. That is worth a bet. I'll endorse that as a wager. And uh, if I had to pick between Charles Sub and KO, I would go with Sub <laughs> because he KO'd him the first time, and it'll be a it'll be a sub this time. But I'm not interested at, at the the plus two thirty or it's plus one fifty actually for Sub. No, just take the under under i think this one should be uh hectic and chaotic and it'll be a first round finish for charles du bronx moving on to the main event heavyweight division heavyweight championship fight former two-time ufc heavyweight champion steepy mutus taking on current yes current Heavyweight champion John Jones, minus 650 for John Bones Jones, plus 475 for Stipe Miocic. Um, not too interested in elaborating on all of the, the, the out-of-the-cage antics and discussions about John Jones' goat, Tom Aspinall, this and that. You know, that those, those, uh, the horse has been, uh, what is the expression? Beat it, something about beating a dead horse. Um, but yeah, those have been talked about a lot, and I'm not going to waste your time talking about them anymore. This is a fight that I think is very difficult to handicap. Obviously, John Jones is the favorite to win. He's very likely to win. But I just don't know how anybody could like know what's going to happen here. Uh, is John Jones going to keep the fight standing? Is it going to be a low tempo? Is John Jones going to look him to take him down to get him out of there quickly? Uh, how decrepit is Stipe Miocic going to look? How decrepit is John Jones going to look? These are all very valid questions. And... I just think that obviously considering Stipe hasn't fought in three and a half years, his last fight was an absolutely brutal knockout where he looked sickly. I mean, he just fought terribly. His reactions and his durability, everything looked slower in that fight. And now he's taken three and a half years off and he's fighting a, a more nimble, agile guy and John Jones. And, you know, I, I've, I've talked a lot of shit on John Jones throughout my, you know, my career, but the guy is an efficient fighter. He really is. And you saw that versus Cyril Gaon. You know, that fight, you can't really draw a ton of conclusions. The one conclusion I drew was, man, that was efficient. You got to give John Jones credit for not having fought in three years, for fighting at heavyweight for the first time, for fighting a supposedly agile striker. He made that shit so easy. And it was partially due to Cyril Gaon being a bum grappler, but you still got to give John some credit for coming off the couch and, and dismantling Gaon that easily. So I kind of think this fight is going to end in some form, a, a bit of a stupid fashion, honestly. I really wouldn't rule out some form of, of a steep A injury, him, you know, rolling his ankle, hurting his knee, some anticlimactic, you know, injury TKO here is honestly a very in play. And, uh, or, or just, or just Stipe getting hurt by like a shot where you're like, what? That that hurt him? Um, I don't know, man. It, it's sad because Stipe Miocic uh, was, is a legendary fighter and at one point was one of the greatest heavyweights of all time. He honestly has one of the best heavyweight fights of all time versus Judo Dos Santos back in 2014. Uh, a great five round, uh, you know, mostly boxing fight between th those two guys. And, uh, you know, Stipe is a great, great fighter. And um, the one thing I'll say about the matchup and everything is that you'll see a lot of people saying like, this is terrible match baking and this is cruel and this and that. This fight was supposed to happen a year ago. And there really wasn't a clear contender for a heavyweight uh, champ or heavyweight contender last year, and I like the fact they get they gave Stipe Miocic one more chance at the belt. Right, he was a two-time champion. He fought in eight 
UFC heavyweight main events, pay-per-view main events in a row. Multiple time champion. He fought in the apex multiple times against Ngannou and Cormier in the small cage. Um, so the guy deserves some respect. He deserves, you know, some special treatment, which he got here getting this title shot. And I know that he got uh, the injury happened, but I think it was the right move to rebook this fight and to give Stipe his last shot, even though I don't think it's going to go too well for him. Uh, it's fun to think about the possibility of Stipe you know, being the first guy to actually, you know, officially beat John Jones. That's a fun possibility to think about, even though it is so unlikely. If I had to pick a way Stipe to win, it would be, you know, landing a punch in the first two or three rounds because um, it's tough to imagine his cardio was holding up too well at, you know, 42 in those later rounds. And, uh, you know, just John Jones is going to get settled into the fight the more and more it goes. And I think that, that Stipe's chances fall off the later it goes. So if Stipe wants to win, it's likely going to have to be a knockout from a punch in the first round or two. Uh, those odds, you know, 10 to 1 for 1, 2, 3 KO, not that great. Uh, yeah, man, it's just a tough fight to bet. And I think that, honestly, John Jones by KO is... Uh, going to be my pick here. Um, Stipe never lost by submission in his career. And it's just hard to see how Jones would, would be in such a dominant grappling position where, where Stipe would be giving up a sub. Uh, I think it is more likely with the KO. And that covers what I was talking about earlier. If Stipe's durability, his athleticism is gone and he gets hurt really easily, that looks good for KO. If Stipe, you know, injures himself, that's good for KO. And, uh, yeah, I think I think it will be a John Jones KO here, and uh, at plus one thirty five, fuck it, I'll endorse that as a wager. And one thing I'll also throw in is if you parlay Rufy KO, Nickel KO, Jones KO, it comes up to plus six ten. A little main card square winner parlay knockout. Go with those plus six hundred, top to bottom. I like Veronica Hardy money line, Mickey Gall money line. Eric Anders, money line. Jonathan Martinez, money line. Rufi KO, Bo Nickel KO, Araujo plus three and a half, and John Jones KO, and the under one and a half in the Olivera fight. All those lines are in the minus 150 to plus 120 range, right? Hardy, 140. Gall, 140. Um, Anders, minus 130. Jonathan Martinez, plus 120. Rufi, minus 140. Arujo plus minus one fifteen, nickel minus one thirty, uh, under one and a half minus one twenty, and Jones KO plus one thirty five. So they're all in that that range of minus one fifty to plus one fifty. So I like all those bets, and that'll do it. I believe uh, we have UFC next week, and then I think we have a week off. So uh, we'll be back next week to talk about more fights. Uh, yeah, we have, uh, oh yeah, Jan versus Higuerito, great card, um, or great fight, I should say. I don't know what the hell's on the rest of the card. So, uh, thank you all for listening. Hope you all enjoyed the podcast, got some good information. Hope you all enjoy the fights and win some bets this weekend. I'll see you all next week before the next UFC event. Peace out, everyone.